Welcome to the If I Had More Time podcast at Mariner's Church. This podcast series invites you into a casual conversation with our senior pastor, Eric Geiger, and our teaching team to hear a few helpful insights and truths they wish they had time to include in the weekend message. Be sure that you have listened to this weekend's message prior to listening to the podcast so you get the most out of our current series. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the If I Had More Time podcast. My name is Dallas. I get to be the Young Adults Pastor, and I am here with Kenton. Welcome to the podcast. I love being here with you, Dallas. Or is it San Antonio? Either one. Or Austin. Right now, Dallas, okay, because okay. the Dallas Mavericks. Okay, good. So it, like it gets good for me. All right. Uh, great message. We just got to hear it. We finished our series, What Would Jesus Say to a Doubting Follower? Mm-hmm. And you told a really cool story, a story that I hadn't really heard. And I'm sure there's many people in our church who hadn't heard. And even based off the room, when other staff members are like, hey, I hadn't, I hadn't heard that story either. Sure, it goes way back. And yeah, the story of you... Coming to Mariners, I had no idea you were fired. You weren't even alive. I was not even alive. (laughs) So I would love, I'm just fascinated by that. I would love to hear a little bit more of that story, especially as it relates to doubt in this topic. Well, it's one of the defining stories of my life. Um, There are, as you live, there are moments in your life God takes you through and they just define who you are. And in that moment, It defined me in many ways. So as I told it, I started at Mariners. I got hired by a guy who was actually a professor at Talbot Seminary. I was a student there. And he was also the pastor at Mariners. His name was Joe Aldrich. Really bright guy. So fun. And um, I I just loved coming to Mariners. Mariners was young. It wasn't large. But it was uh, exciting and thrilling, and it really came to work with him. He went and became the president, as I said, at a Christian college. And then um, we went through four years of a lot of confusion. And there are things that I learned that were so powerful. In the message, I talk about how it led to this moment of doubt, which it did, because there were uh, three transitions uh, they all were painful. And and actually, one of the lessons that I learned that served great in the hiring and actually in hiring Eric was this sense, uh, an axiom that I learned, which is when you hire a senior pastor, you, there has to be really a senior pastor works in a church because there's a match in the story of the church, the story of the community, and the story of the senior pastor. And what I learned in those days is, you know, all of them were wonderful guys, but the, their story and the church's story and the community story didn't match. Mm. And so it wasn't that they were wrong as people. They're wonderful people. You just didn't have the match. And I didn't know that. I just got to live through it. And it developed a powerful conviction. Now, at the time, <laughs> I did not know that and, you know, wouldn't have even begin to be able to articulate it. But what I did is I went through, and so I had just gotten married. Uh, Lori and I, you know, starting off, really exciting ministry. Had lots of UCI students and actually did two different college groups, had UCI students and OCC students. And so, you know, different groups. Really, it was fun. But then he left. And so I uh, had a job opportunity, and I thought, oh, maybe this is a good time to leave. And really prayed and said, okay, God, Whatever you want, we'll do. And he was clear. He said, no, I want you to stay. And as I said, you know, went through that, then with the next guy and the next guy, then what's painful in it is, so for two of them, I had two or three opportunities to leave. And then the last guy, the church, he just, his story, the church's story, it just didn't work. And the church was really going down. And I mean, the church was down to a couple hundred people. I mean, it was painful. And we weren't making it financially as a church. No, you know, nothing was work. And so, you know, he came and, you know, basically said, here's my plan. And it was the same plan that he had done the last year. And really, his messages were not good. He wasn't spending the time, you know. And so being a good person like him, I said, hey, that that's not going to work. It didn't work last year. It won't work. You should just spend more time in your messages. Well, he fired me for that. And so that was the devastating moment that I talked about in doubt because it, it was, 
I had trusted God in my mind and in Lori's mind. And, you know, we are a young family. We are financially at the edge. And now the church had, had gone down so severely, it appeared to me, you know, I'm not going to have any opportunities. Now, that's not true. But in the moment, that's the problem with doubt, hmm. is doubt doesn't make you think reasonably. Doubt makes you blind. And so Lori and I are sitting at home. I can remember, and we got two young kids. We have no money. We're out of a job. I've said no to three jobs over four years that were great jobs as far as career. And every one of them, it was like, but God, you told me to say no. You did this. And yes, I love these people. And yes, it, you know, but you know what? Now I'm alone. Now we're alone. Now I've got this obligation. I even thought about, you know, maybe I shouldn't be in ministry. That didn't last very long. But in that doubt, you know, you swirl and go, I'm, yeah. maybe this is the wrong job. Maybe I didn't do the right thing there. But it, there was such a, a blinding moment of pain in that moment. I mean, I understand where Thomas, you know, is just blurts it out and goes, I can't believe, I won't believe. Mm -hmm. And and I like it. I love that God's given us. Because when you read it, you read it almost, it's almost antiseptic. It's like, oh, I, I don't believe. Like, it's not hard. But he, he, I think he punched out and goes, you know, to say he's a disciple, mm -hmm. you know, he's one of, and he's going, I won't believe I won't believe it. And it's the defining truth of the Christianity. It's the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, if he can say it, I can say it. So I spun out. But as I look back on it, I learned some lessons during that time, you know, because God says he doesn't ever waste pain. And he really mm -hmm. does build, um, he builds us into the kind of people he wants us to be. So he makes us more resilient. He promised to make you know, even in the broken places in our life, he, he builds treasures. So one treasure that I have out of that time is that lesson because I reflected on it a lot. You know, why, why is it that Mariners couldn't figure out how to hire a pastor and went through three and every one of them didn't work? Well, I, I learned, you, you know, it's the, it's the story of the church. It's the story of the community and the story of the pastor. And and it's not the only thing. They've got to match in doctrine, but that really mm. has to match. And it did not match for those three. So it wasn't their fault, and it really wasn't the church's fault, but it's a mistake that you couldn't undo. So that was one really good lesson. Another lesson that I learned is uh, resiliency. Um, I, you know, for you, Dallas, it would be really fun to work at Mariners. I mean, you get to work with singles mm -hmm. and it's going and almost everything that you touch, it works. And a lot of that is because the energy and what happens and really, quite frankly, the great job that Eric does. Mm -hmm. I learned what it meant to do great ministry and it not work and to do what you're called to do and do the best job you can and deliver great messages and while my ministry was working, the church just keep going down and it didn't matter. It didn't matter because I couldn't make it work. Sundays, mornings, or, you know, the weekend services are what make a church work. Yeah. And I couldn't make it work. And it was so discouraging, but <clears throat> I did what I needed to do. And I, I learned such great lessons about perseverance and character and what it means to follow Jesus. And, you know, kind of trust him. And then it, I mean, it whipsawed on me because all of a sudden it was like, whoa, I did this and it didn't turn out. Mm -hmm. You know, we all, you know, we're all great loving Christians, you know, on a sunny day. <laughs> but, you know, until it's not. Mm -hmm. And the problem is we live in a broken world and it isn't always sunny and it's painful. And our lives, you know, the world breaks apart on us and we live in a broken world. And that's not God punishing us. That's a broken world, and it just smashes into us. And in broken world moments, we will doubt. We will spin out. We are out of control. And so I love it because I learned some great lessons in that moment. Uh, I lived. There's a lot of lessons I carried for the next 38 years because of that. Um, you know, so God didn't waste it. And you talked about investigating and the peace of God. Yes. And even in the midst of a, the right. church is in decline, you got fired. Yeah. You said yes to come back to work at Mariners. So how did you have the peace of God? How did you find the peace of God in that season? That's a great question. So 
Well, in the story of Thomas, just like you said, I mean, God gives us grace and space, which he did to me. And that was so valuable because when you're spinning and in the fog, you, you just can't see straight. So you need you need to give yourself grace and space. You need to embrace the grace and space that God gives you. Um, but then when he shows up, you know, peace is such a, you know, shalom. It, it is such a beautiful thing that in that difficult moment, Jesus came to Thomas, and I feel like he came to me, and I think he comes to everyone, and he says, I'm going to help you put the pieces together. Shalom is when the pieces don't fit. Uh, I mean, sh the lack of shalom is when the pieces don't fit. But so he's going to come and say, I'll help you put the pieces together. But then the third thing is he does challenge us to, you know, who am I? And I did have to go through that journey and answer the questions, okay, who do I really believe that you are? And so in my doubt, you know, I was convinced that he didn't love me. He wasn't good. He wasn't faithful. He couldn't be trusted. He had let me down. He had set me up to fail. Um, he wanted me to be embarrassed. I mean, these are they're sad things, but they're, it's what I thought at the moment. But when I went through, because the, the journey through drought and doubt is Jesus saying, you know, who am I? But specifically who I am in the incarnation Christmas, you know, am I the God who came into this world and mm -hmm. am like you and I understand you? I, mm -hmm. You know, that is the understanding love of God, that he is like me. He understands me. He is with us. He's not distant and far. And when you resolve that, I mean, there are just a lot of doubts that cannot, you cannot have these doubts of I'm alone and I'm forgotten and he doesn't understand if you're going to say, but he became like me and he gave up heaven and he forever is like me. And he, he knows what it's like to be human. Even today, there is Jesus who is human and God in heaven and he understands humanity. I'm not alone. And it doesn't answer every question, but it sure means that, you know, it just, it sheds those. Like I said, and then the other one is the cross that it isn't what I do. Because I, I think naturally in that moment, I thought somehow I failed. You know, you, you naturally look back and in that moment, I go, what did I do wrong? Did I fail this guy? Did I do, you know, I tried to be faithful and good and trustworthy. I, you know, I love the way I wanted to be loved. I told, it was, I went to that pastor one-on-one. -on -one. I didn't say that in front of people. I, I didn't, you know, I told him, I said, look at this is, the, I don't think this will work. This is what I think you should do. And he fired me for it. And it was like, wow. You know? mm. But then who's Jesus? Jesus is, he does not leave me. And and he loves me. You know, he really loves me. And so even though I didn't feel loved in it, I, I saw that. So in that moment, I felt like, I, you know, we resolved some things and then had to start moving forward. So why did I come back to Mariners? I came back to Mariners because I knew who Jesus was and I knew I could trust him. I didn't have those doubts anymore. The second thing is, is I, Lori and I loved the people at Mariners. I mean, there wasn't a lot of them left. There was only a couple hundred, but we had gone through a very sad and difficult time and we loved them. And, and in that moment, it was like, wouldn't it be good? I had no sense that Mariners would be like it is today. I just thought, what if we could just not die? <laughs> it's like, you know, and really that's all it was. Yeah. What if we could just be a church that didn't fail and die? What if we could just love each other? And in loving each other, what if we could show the beauty to this community of people who love Jesus, trust Jesus, and, you know, in, in a difficult time, we became something beautiful. That's all that I could see. We had, you know, no sense of a large church, anything like yeah. that is just saying, let's be just be a loving community. And so we loved them. And it was like, you know, it was either go to Texas, which, you know, how Dallas, that's always got to be the right answer. Mm. Or, you know, stay at Mariners or come back to Mariners. And so there was a, it was tricky because Mariners had a number of things that I felt like had to change. And so I wrote them a letter of, of five things that I felt like if I came back, because I knew it, and there were things that were just goofy about it that had become goofy that shouldn't be a part of it. And in the pain of it, you know, that's the value is that I could learn it and say, now I'm not coming unless these five things 
change. And actually, the five things became five driving values for the church that lasted mm-hmm. for the next 38 years. Wow. And then Eric's kind of reframed them. But that was, we talked about teaching God's word, being God's loving family. Every believer is a minister with a ministry. We're going to be innovative and relevant and then share God's love through, you know, a lifestyle. And those five things, there were things underneath it that were problems. But mm. the good side is I actually knew what the problems were at Mariners. And so, you know, we could deal with them mm-hmm. together. And so we did. And they loved me. But I was I was 29 years old. It was like I was no prize. <laughs> yeah. And it's like I was, they were, you know, I was still young and... There was a lot I didn't know, and mm-hmm. we got to learn together. There's two things that you have taught me that really stood out um, just hearing you. So we got to go to Israel last year, yeah. and Israel was when the incarnation like came to life for me, Yeah, just walking where Jesus walked. In Bethlehem. Right? I mean, everywhere. Yeah, that yeah, that's oh, right. yeah. yeah. and uh, then number two is something you taught me more recently was believe than do what God said. Mm-hmm. So you had to, you said something in your message of like re-believing. Mm-hmm. So you believed and then you did what God said right. all throughout this journey. Right. Uh, beautiful to just see it in your life and on display. Mm-hmm. And what does that look like for us to continue to believe even though I've already believed? Right. Because that is what the Christian life is, is believe. And then we kind of falter. Then I got to re-believe and then re-believe. Because we fall. And I think it's really the gift of why Jesus gave us the Lord's Supper, because he says, you're going to forget. So he says, do this, keep doing it. Well, why do we have to keep doing it? Well, because we keep forgetting. Yeah. And the, in the doing, uh, the things that are so important, that's such a gift to the church, that we we get to constantly remember who Jesus is just in communion, which is the exact same story mm-hmm. of doubt with Thomas. Mm-hmm. So it's that important. Yeah. Even thinking about Thomas, I every time I read Thomas, I always think he gets a bad rap. It's like, oh, doubting Thomas. Yeah. And I try to distance myself. But I love how you opened, hey, he was a disciple. Yeah. Like he was courageous. He was loyal. Yeah. Uh, do you think Thomas gets a bad rap? That's an interesting question. Um, because he's called doubting Thomas? He's called doubting. Like, well, I just assume doubting. We do doubting. in a sense. Yes and no. So is doubting bad? Your assumption when you say doubting is a bad thing. Yeah. So that's like saying human Thomas mm-hmm. or uh, wonderfully human, perfectly human Thomas. Yeah. Well, he's perfectly human. So to doubt, there's some, you know, somebody said something to doubt is human. Well, doubting isn't bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not even flawed. It's just a part of the human experience. Yeah. And Jesus doesn't leave us in our doubts. He doesn't shame us for our doubts. He doesn't condemn us for our doubts. He actually comes to us, he gives us space, but then he challenges us in our doubts. The challenge in doubts is, now look at the truth. You you can't just sit here. He doesn't pick us up and move us. He challenges us. So people, you know, I've met lots of people who have doubts and and they say, I don't know, I don't know. And I go, what are you doing to that? And I go, well, I just don't have them. And if God was God or, you know, he'd, he'd like fix me or he'd show up. And I'm like, no, that's not what, you know, it, what are you doing to pursue that? Yeah. How are you answering that question? You have a great question. That's a good question. Jesus wants to answer that question. Mm-hmm. What would it look like you for you to pursue that question? The powerful thing in the story is, I mean, nobody else doubted, but nobody else said that great confession of faith. All of the disciples doubted. I mean, mm-hmm. they doubted before. They go, no, I don't believe that. They didn't yeah. believe the women. They'd even after the resurrection, it says they doubted and they doubted. So... Yeah, Thomas gets a bad rap because one, people think doubting's bad. Two, because he's identified at it. And three, they don't identify, well, every one of them did it. It's yeah. just a part of life. I actually think the three, you know, the you know, he's this courageous guy. You know, I love his attitude of, hey, if we're going to die, let's go. That's, I feel like that. I mean, I'm kind of the, you want, if we got to die, let's go die. <laughs> you know, as long as it's noble, I'll, yeah, right. I'm, I'm willing to go die. So I like that about him. And I like his need for clarity. You know, he's the guy going, wait, we don't know where you're going, what you're doing. So I actually relate to him a lot hmm. uh, as a person. But, you know, I think that's why the disciples are given to us because in all of them, yeah, they have character qualities that we can connect with and go, oh, I'm like that. Or I mm-hmm. sure do that a lot. Yeah. And there's this moment. So doubting, this is the good news. 
doubting is okay. Oh, yeah. It's not bad. Jesus meets us there, thank goodness. That's right. But there's this moment when he calls us into something. Right. So it's that idea of leaning into Jesus with our doubts. Right. How do we see the world lean away from Jesus and doubts? There's well, leaning in and leaning away. Yeah, I think I think the challenge is he's saying investigate and look at the evidence. So I think the way people lean in is they go, okay, what does God's word say? Because God says lots of things or does things that confuse us. So it's leaning in and saying, well, what does God say? How does God act? What do we do? Mm-hmm. Leaning back is, I think, saying, I don't get it. I don't understand. Well, he should show it to me. Somehow I should have some insight. Somehow if God was God, he would just prove it to me, mm-hmm. which is what the whole last verse is about. He says, you know, Thomas, you're great because you saw it. But blessed, I mean, this is who we are in this. This is the season of the Christian world we live in. We're blessed when we believe without seeing. So we're called to say, okay, we have God. We have evidence. We have God's word. So I can find Jesus in God's word. People who don't pursue Jesus and saying, what does his word say? I think, you know, the ones, people who don't go to church, I think that's the worst way. Because I think, you know, one of the interesting things that, you know, we didn't have time to point out is what I'm fascinated by Thomas is he didn't disconnect. I think, you know, when I read that story, I think I know that if I was Thomas and I was, I'm around all these disciples that saw Jesus and they're all in and I'm out, mm-hmm. I would stop being around them. <laughs> I would yep. just go, I don't want to be around you. I'm sick of hearing it. Great for you. Mm-hmm. I'm done with it. But amazingly, Thomas didn't isolate. And he didn't separate when he didn't have that common experience. I think that is amazingly courageous of Thomas. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way people then step away is they go, you know what? I'm confused, so I I can't go to church. I'm not sure I believe this. And that's the worst thing because that's leaning out as opposed to saying, wait, I'm supposed to investigate who Mm -hmm. Jesus is and how he acts. And now I'm not around the people who love Jesus. I'm not seeing what Jesus does. I'm not hearing his yep. word taught. I think that's a fool's game. And so, you know, I didn't have time to go into it because it's just not. But Thomas really is a phenomenal model of somebody mm-hmm. who, man, he stayed connected in community when he felt isolated, betrayed, embarrassed, and he was the only one. I mm-hmm. mean, who does that? That is darn mm-hmm. courageous. And so, even contrasting with Peter. Peter went home. Yeah. Like, he, dead, Peter was out. It went yeah, home. He's gone, and, and Thomas stuck around, which are the, it was cool to like see that yeah. in the text. Uh-huh. That's he great. Did. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking time. Sure. Love the message. Great. Everybody be encouraged that you can come to Jesus with your doubts. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us today on the If I Had More Time podcast hosted by Mariner's Church. We hope to see you next weekend at any of our congregations across Southern California or online. To view our service times at each congregation, be sure to check out our website at marinerschurch.org.